Bizarre Riot took place 50 years ago on February 6, 1971, but the story really starts a few months before that, with Maria Magallan, Oralia Magallan, and a group of women in the nearby neighborhood they called Far Chiquito. The group of women formed a collective they called Union y Fuerza, where they received support and guidance from Efraín Fernández, Raquel Orendain, Susan Law, and other community leaders. They organized around several key issues, from dealing with bad infrastructure to fighting against the overwhelming amount of far police brutality that she and her community were exposed to. For those that don't know, in 1970 and 71, the FAR Police Department had developed a real nasty reputation for brutalizing people in our community, even including some young teenagers. Two of the worst offenders were police officers Mateo Sandoval and Gilbert Zuniga, who along with Chief Alfredo Ramirez would publicly deny the charges from the community. It had gotten bad, and Maria Magallan witnessed that firsthand in the aftermath of one beating. She saw a neighbor's kid a short while after he got attacked by police officer Sandoval. When I asked Maria about that night, she told me, Fue una de las cosas reales. No fue algo que alguien nos dijo, pero algo que vimos, que estaba golpeado. She also described to me how badly bruised and bloody this poor kid was. Along with this young teenager, there was others like 24-year-old Guadalupe Lucio Salinas and 44-year-old Manuel Mata who were both brutalized by Sandoval. Other people that were also abused by the FAR Police Department included Daniel Vasquez and Noe Rocha. Those two beatings in particular got covered from the Yamero newspaper and word began to spread about what was happening in FAR. According to Susan Law, one of the key moments for the women in Union y Fuerza involved the screening of the classic film, South of the Earth. Made by blacklisted filmmakers and actors, coal miners and working people. Law told me how this film about coal miners going on a strike and women picketing right alongside them got everyone inspired. The brutality that was being unleashed by the fire police department will lead to Union y Fuerza organizing a picket similar to the one seen in South of the Earth in front of Far City Hall. The odd day picket on February 6, 1971 would incorporate different people taking turns in each other's spots throughout that day. Well, uh, a lot of people started congregating. Uh, a lot of people never seen anything like this before. On that afternoon and early evening, more and more people started joining into protests. The chants got louder and louder. Yamato writer David Fishlow estimates the crowd at being over 200 to 300 people. I talked to Mr. Fernandez. I just said, Mr. Fernandez, I thought this was going to be a peaceful demonstration. And I told him that uh, the people were only saying what they felt. They were, they were yelling because that's the way they felt about the police brutality. And then within minutes, fire trucks pulled up with their red lights going. And they, sp they proceeded to spray water under high pressure at the crowd that was standing in front of the police station. There were little children there. There were old men, old women, uh, and some young people too. It was a senseless thing to do, and, and it, was, it was what triggered the riot that night. Magallan explained to me. Cuando comenzaron los bomberos a echarle agua a la gente, las señoras corrieron para este lado y llevaban piedras de sus casas. Los men que estaban en las cantinas de esas salieron, y ellos ni sabían de qué se trataba. Pero salieron ellos y dijeron, Señoras, ¿sabes qué? Le vamos a ayudar. Pues sí, salieron todos los borrachitos de ahí, y las señoras le llevaban las piedras a ellos. And the crowd started this person. They started running in a different direction, and of course I, I did get one of the shotguns and uh, some tear gas, and I had to shoot it in a different direction. The policemen were really overreacting in firing their weapons. Uh, they were real bullets, 38 caliber bullets. A, a large group of law enforcement officers came into the area, and just like a bunch of shock troops, they swept through the, through the street, arresting selectively young Mexican-Americans and especially those that seem to have long hair or had any of the trademarks of liberal people or, or militant people. Ultimately, as things escalated, it would lead to the deaths of 20-year-old Alfonso Loredo Flores, who was shot and killed by Deputy Sheriff Robert C. Johnson. No date has been set for the trial of the Deputy Sheriff indicted for negligent homicide in the death of Poncho Flores. 
In 2018, Alfonso's widow, Lydia Flores, remembered that day vividly in an interview she did with Selena Ramos. In her recollection, she really brings to life the story of Alfonso Loredo Flores and who he was as a person before he was murdered that day. She remembers first meeting Flores at a dance in Far, Texas, and the two would end up dating for six and a half years before they got married. They had one daughter together named Belinda. She fondly remembers going on dates with them to a nearby orange field, stealing oranges from there, and then taking them to a drive-in theater together. Alfonso had worked in the fields for years. He would pick tomatoes, cucumbers, strawberries, but at this point in his life, he was working construction in Corpus Christi. He had arrived back too far from Corpus Christi the day of his death. They had spent the day in Reynosa getting earrings for their young daughter Belinda. They got home from Mexico and he went to go play pool with his friends at a nearby cantina. It was then that someone told him about the riot that was taking place out on Cage and Far. He was curious so he went out to go see what was going on on the corner of Cage and Bell where Ramos Hair Styling Center is located. His friends later told Lydia that a police officer had a weapon pointed at them and told them to leave. Lydia says that his last words were, quote, no, we're not doing anything, end quote. She continued by saying that he was just standing there with his hands in his pocket. The next thing his friends saw was Alfonso lying on the floor. Lydia says that the police tried to say it was a rock injury, but it wasn't a rock at all. It was a bullet. He was officially pronounced dead on February 7, 1971 in Harlingen, Texas. In the following days, they had viewings at the De Leon Cemetery home and he was buried at the Guadalupe Cemetery in Far, Texas. Flores left behind his father, Manuel Flores, his mother, Marta Loredo, his wife, Lydia, and their child, Belinda Flores. As Union y Fuerza continued organizing until those police officers and officials were all gone, Different tactics included more day-long pickets and a boycott of businesses in South Far. Eventually, Mayor Bo, Police Chief Ramirez, and four commissioners all ended up resigning after all the pressure from Union y Fuerza and the community. Unfortunately, Johnson was later acquitted for his role in the death of Alfonso Loredo Flores. David Hall, who represented Lydia Flores, explained to me what happened in that case. Despite what everyone saw that night in Far, Hall said, the bullet was so malformed, you couldn't link it to anybody's gun. 50 years later, and we are still struggling with police violence in our communities. Last August, a teenager who lives a few blocks away from me was shot by the Far Police Department. This city is more militarized than ever. This past July also marks the one-year anniversary of Jorge Gonzalez's death, who tragically died due to injuries sustained from Hidalgo County Sheriff's officers. And there are many, many more examples of police violence that have happened decade after decade in our community. So the fight against this must continue. Thank <laughs> you.